So um, this slide is um, representative of um, the March of Intellect, which was, uh, and it's, it's a, um, a cartoon, or a, it's a cartoon by Robert S Seymour, um, published in 1828. And it's representative of a move um, um, uh, campaign um, by um, the um, defenders of reason to sweep aside um, uh, all the old knowledge. Um, and uh, it's a Whig vision of the dissemination of general knowledge in the march of intellect. And you can see here that it's associated with the apocalyptic steam engine of reason with its gaslight eyes, its textbook head, and the University of London as the crown. Um, <laughs> issuing balloons of smoke progress, and perhaps someone later can tell me why balloons like this are related to the French Revolution, but I understand that they are, um, and aided on the ground by one of the University of London's founders, Henry Broom, and you see him uh, at the head, the top of the broom, uh, sweeping old England before him. Now, this notion of um, progress uh, became affiliated with the campaigns for access to the cheap press. Um, and the um, uh, part of the uh, 19th century campaign uh, for um, the reduction of taxes on the newspaper press, which were high and which were reduced considerably in 1833. Um, the press was seen as a technology of the march and the disseminator of the information. And you can see the old knowledge, you know, the old books and so on, you know, and the lawyers' um, briefs uh, being swept away and um, the volumes in this image um, that were going to, a reason, full of reason and information that were going to uh, replace them. Um, and I want, so that was in the 1820s, and um, I just wanted to bring us up to the 90s where I'm going to be uh, focusing um, to look at um, W.T. Stead's pronouncement from prison uh, on his vision of the role of the press in 1886. So he, uh, he situates and pronounces on the political character of news. And this is a theme that I want to pursue, the way in which the political identity of news has uh, dominated the way we have thought of news and helped sustain the distinction between the periodical and the newspaper. So uh, here's Stead talking about um, you know, the creation by the telegraph and the printing press into a vast agora. Um, uh, in which the discussion of the affairs of state is carried on. And the journalist is uh, a keeper of a peep show through which men may catch glimpses of the great drama of contemporary life and history. And he then points to the um, agency of the press and the way it creates change in government I've seen cabinets upset, ministers driven into retirement, and so on, laws repealed, great social reforms initiated, and so on. Armies sent hither and thither. I mean, Stead's vision is, you know, in a way, uh, megalomaniacal since he's an editor. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to um, underline the way in which, for Stead, news is, you know, nothing if not political. And when Stead begins a, a paper of his own, um, which is a monthly uh, in the um, latter part of the 19th century in 1890, um, he talks about the grim necessity of having to include fiction in a newspaper. To him, this is you know, anathema, um, because the world of the newspaper is politics, and fiction has no place there. All of you from France or who are familiar with the uh, Feuilleton know how you know culturally specific this problem of Stead's is, but there it is. Um, okay, um, so I want to go on now to um, make an argument, and I wanted to uh, outline very briefly the argument I'm trying to make 
First of all, I'm going to talk about serials in their in-between status, in between the event, or in another way of putting that, the news or the contemporary, and uh, the periodical and newspaper, uh, and the readership. So the periodical or newspaper I'm going to think about as, you know, a mercury. Um, and um, I then um, want to um, go on and try and um, disarticulate, if you like, the components of the press uh, or of the um, or serials into periodicals and newspapers and think about, to some extent, how their differences are um, germane. Um, and then I want to try to move an argument um, for uh, periodicals as the carriers uh, and um, promulgators of news, not political news. And fourthly, I want to look at an example of an area um, which is not normally thought about in terms of news or at that time, politics, uh, although we all know about the politics of the art markets now, but art and news. And through the example of a group who thought of themselves as the writers of new art criticism and their attempts to um, transform the um, exhibition policies and the uh, purchase arrangements of two uh, major art uh, foundations in the United Kingdom in uh, the 1890s, the Tate Gallery um, and um, the um, Royal Academy. Right. So, um, sorry, I don't know why, why we got there. Hold on. From its early history to its most recent, the primary function of the press has been represented as a mediator between events and readers located in the imaginary between them. Its function as a technology of communication and a carrier of information may be seen in individual serial titles that invoke Mercury, the winged servant of the Greco-Roman gods, for whom Mercury carried and speedily delivered messages, but also as the um, um, sign, if you like, of the post um, and its carriers. So, we see here uh, an image, um, a 16th century image of, um, of Giovanni da Bologna of Mercury uh, with his wings uh, and um, uh, on his, um, um, uh, the staff he's carrying and his wings on his helmet and on his um, ankles. Um, and we see also a 19th century quotation where the word Mercury becomes uh, a noun um, and for um, the messengers of the post and the press, they are actually called Mercuries. Um, and these Mercuries um, are supposed to embody these functions of technology, speedy delivery, and information. But the Athenaeum is not convinced of this and when they talk about uh, the newsboys those chicken-hearted Mercuries, the postboys, always pulled up in Hammersmith before they faced the common. So they were not fulfilling their role as a speedy deliverer <laughs> of information. Um, and if we look at the titles of some periodicals in the 19th century, and I think you have these in France as well, um, we have Mercuries. Uh, the Leeds Mercury and the Liverpool Mercury. Um, on these mastheads. Um, notwithstanding the fields of media history, communication studies, and theory that problematize mediation and they thicken it to transform it from a transparent technology of instant conveyance to one of interruption, remediation, and interpretation, this notion of the direct and rapid transport of intact information survives in later and current serials, such as the 19th century Truman's and Exeter's Flying Post, the Morning Herald, and all the heralds, there are many heralds, the Morning Chronicle, and all the chronicles, 
Galliani's messenger, Il Messaggero, the telegraph, the mirror, and all the observers, Lobs, Le Nouvel Observateur, and it hovers also this notion of speed and transmission in the notion of review, the retrospect of the recent past from the present, la revue de des mondes and all the reviews. These omnibuses of aggregated information deliver in a timely series of reports at regular intervals in an open-ended series reports of events to readers who are, quote, within reach of their distribution network. A geographical locus of information, which prevailed, of course, in times of print, the imagined community that has changed radically over time as print formats are digitally dispatched and translated by technologies that neither Mercury and his employers nor 19th century editors ever imagined. Likewise, the shift from new as an adjective a new discrete message about a recent event, to its commodification as the collective noun news, a thing in itself, which dates in the Oxford English Dictionary from the 16th century, and we see it in the 17th century, also suggests the position of news in between, in a silent reference to the past, which it is replacing by the present. But this notional present, the window in which the issue is new, is itself unstable in real time. The date stamp is an identification marker of issues. And you see that you see the tax um, in that um, image over there, uh, which is the um, tax of the of the of the state on the on the print, on the newsprint, with its with a date on it, as well as of course the date stamp on the paper. Um, so it's an identification marker of issues that locates each one in the sequence of a longer run and ties the newspaper report of any single issue to a narrow window of time present. However, the routine practice of newspaper editors or sub-editors of what we call scissors and paste journalism, in which they source their latest editions from earlier stories in other papers which they then reprint, this practice of, of, of um, um, uh, scissors and paste, it enlarges the present and it distends the window often beyond the date of the source. Now in this slide, we see a skeleton who, which is dead to original writing himself, as suggested here, the skeletal editor raises the dead story, tweaks it or edits it for reprinting, cut, it's cutting it up, and compiles the morgue, the in-house repository of old stories that many titles kept for future reference. In the United States, certainly, and in the United Kingdom, I don't know whether newspapers had morgues here or what you call them, but it, it is a very clear um, library. It's an in-house library for the use of journalists. Um, sometimes when I have requested um, an item from a digital um, copy of a sixth edition on a single day of the London Times, um, or I know that the references to the, sorry, when I know the references to the sixth edition of London Times, I've had to write to the Times and they have, the only example is not in the newspaper whole, but they have a morgue with cuttings. And that's where they got my reference. Digital um, media historians have recently been engaged um, in providing evidence of this practice of uh, scissors and paste journalism by tracing long trails of newspaper stories across different titles. Um, and um, here are some, there are three people here. Um, Eleanor, Ellen Gruber Garvey um, has written a paper about, uh, a book about um, American scrapbooks. Uh, and Stephen Pigeon, uh, who has written this evocatively named article um, in the Journal of Victorian Culture, is actually talking about the way newspaper, um, uh, newspapers steal material 
uh, disseminate it and revise it. Uh, and um, Melanie Beals has a website which is um, free and accessible, uh, tracing uh, the passage of particular stories across journals in time. Many news stories then are part of a long series of reprinted versions in between other reprints. The whole um, this topic of reprinting is something that we need to think more about in respect to um, all print culture. Uh, very often, you know, first editions of um, books that we look at are not the ones that were mostly read or disseminated. Um, and certainly with uh, newspapers, uh, there's a huge uh, time window in which newspapers are read. Um, the Daily News seeks to appear authoritative, date-stamped, and self-contained, resisting its in-betweenness while locked in a business model predicated on instant obsolescence and knowing first that some of its stories are not original and have been remediated from other and earlier sources, and B, that the entirety of their reporting in any single issue will be superseded by later reporting. A word reporting that courts reification and objectivity, but absolutely in the face of eclipse. And even within the time frame of a single day, newspapers in the 19th century in Britain often had seven different editions, right? So, you know, it's not only that you have, you know, day-to-day -day, uh, instant obsolescence, but actually stories disappear, move, are moved about um, in a single day in different editions. You know, multiple editions, that's another thing we need to think about. When you look at a single issue of a newspaper, you can be sure that there are others on the same day in a different library that have different contents and look different. Between old and an ever-evolving new, the news is always poised on the edge of displacement, the rapid loss of its presentism, as it is unseated by the future that pushes it to the past in the wake of the most recent news. Thus, the promise of the press represented in all these news titles is belied routinely by the next edition. It is always already in between. And I just wanted to point to you know, some of the many uh, good scholarly um, research uh, papers on this problem of time. Uh, there's a special issue of media history on ephemera and the you know, notion that newspapers are ephemeral or that periodicals are, uh, which librarians like to kind of think about when they discard them. Um, and uh, Margaret Beetham's uh, really important and early paper uh, on a theory of the periodical as a publishing genre. Uh, Mark Turner's um, piece on periodical time, and again, a later Turner piece on the unruliness of serials in the 19th century. So time is a really large uh, component, it seems to me, of the uh, basis uh, of the press and the way the press cultivates and um, um, exploits, if you like, time. If the presentism of the press is precarious, it is also its primary selling point and an imperative ingredient in serial publication embedded in press items and formats. Contemporaneity lurks in its adverts its reviews of new books, its reviews of current theater, dance, musical productions, and art exhibitions, its coverage of sport, and its notes or gossip about society, but also it carries news about societies, scientific, linguistic, philatelic. Irrespective of whether this range of news occurs in every single issue, the diversity of this range fuels the advertising revenue on which titles depend. However, advertising is the only department these diverse topics dominate in the 19th century newspaper press. The categories of news that usurp the concept of the press for working journalists and editors, historical and contemporary readers, and press historians are political and financial news. Those are the dominant definitions of 
um, news. Business intelligence that moved between trade markets and readers was the impetus for the earliest news sheets that consisted of advertising sheets and accounts of the movement of trade and commodities. Think about, for example, the shipping news, which by the 18th century took the forms of the latest market prices, money and commodity, of shipping arrivals and departures and of ads combined with some news reporting. But political news colonized this press and by the 19th century dominated British dailies and some weeklies. In metropolitan newspapers, beside reports of the latest national and foreign news toward the front of the issues, most of the other departments of the paper, such as detailed, sometimes verbatim parliamentary reports, the ample space and very prestigious labor allocated to leaders or edit editorials and correspondents, they all, leaders, editorials, um, uh, concern politics, as seen in Stead's notion of government by journalism, which I quoted earlier, that assumes politics is the basis of news and newspapers. Moreover, most British newspapers, metropolitan and local, until late in the 19th century, had public political links with a political party or persuasion. And if occasionally titles change their political allegiances as their ownership changes, the entire framing of the news tended to be oriented to political parties or groups that the newspaper supported. And that in turn, these groups supported the newspaper through leaks, political party notices, and adverts, whose, which they would place in the papers and you know, add to their financial status, and whose members or supporters the paper relied upon as readers. So you know, if you're a Whig, then you read the Whig paper in your town. Uh, you know, few papers could survive independent of political parties or groups, or the politicized readers whose views they reflected and shaped. John North, who is the editor of the Waterloo Directory of 19th century newspapers and periodicals, which if you're interested in this field, irrespective of what national background you come from, it is really worth looking at the, um, um, the mode of, um, of editing and of the kinds of materials that John North includes in this huge um, ambitious enterprise to include every single 19th century British newspaper and periodical with some notion of its editors, its place of publications or places of publications. And it introduces a term I just wanted to draw to your attention, which is issuing bodies. So these are the interested funders of news, the gods in the Mercury uh, gods um, partnership. Um, he calls them issuing bodies, and they include not only political groups, but um, religious groups, for example, but other groups too, such as the Church Times or the Methodist Recorder. So that notion of issuing bodies is always a useful question, I think, to ask yourself about who might be the issuing body. Now, we call these... Uh, sometimes we call these people publishers, and we kind of consign them to economic groups, uh, which, of course, have very interesting other um, publishing activities that you want to look at in relation to the periodical or newspaper they're publishing. But actually, some of these um, are publishers are publishing for issuing bodies, which have a rather more direct um, ideological commitment. Even the inclusion of reviews in the 19th century British press was contingent on the regular parliamentary recesses, that is the breaks that Parliament took, several times a year for long periods, because Parliament didn't work too hard in the 19th century, which freed space for non-political news. So when there was no need for verbatim parliamentary reports, and there was more space because the leader columns were denuded of, po of politics, book reviews had breathing space. And they could appear in newspapers only during, in some newspapers, only during parliamentary recesses. Given the overwhelming political cast of most daily newspapers, it is unsurprising then that historically newspapers in Britain did not attract many women readers. 
except in parliamentary recesses, women whom at this time in Britain were excluded from holding political or indeed any office until the mid 19th century. Nor did this type of title tend to court women in their news contents. The transmission of news by the press messengers in the metropolis was largely from male journalists about political events with male actants from male institutions to politicized readers who were also overwhelmingly male. Titles in the regions and local and Sunday papers were more porous. They habitually carried a greater range of news, including some or all of the following. Local parish news reports, fiction, poetry, book and other reviews, possibly fashion, gossip, local food, market prices and local ads and announcements that targeted women readers. So news and newspapers are problematized terms in this period divided between daily papers or multiple issues per week and regional and local weeklies. The dailies targeted men and they carried a restricted range of political and business news while the Mercury is transmitting it and the readers tended to be similarly male. And this accounts for the prevailing view, which I shall challenge, that news by definition is political news and that it is to be found in newspapers and not in periodicals. This brings me to a generic point. The prevailing disposition to regard the function of the press as the transmission of news underlies important fissures in the serial and the press as categories and a distinction which as soon as you try to apply it becomes very fuzzy and beset by exception, but a distinction between newspapers and what I'm calling periodicals. These periodicals include weeklies, fortnightlies, monthlies, quarterlies, and annuals. Periodicals permit and they boast a wider range of contents than newspapers, although weeklies may remain more closely tied to the political agenda. And because of their more inclusive content, periodicals as a category of serial include women historically more than newspapers do, as women as readers, but also as founders of, of titles, as editors, as writers, as artists, as engravers, and very occasionally as printer compositors. Women's groups are also among the issuing bodies of periodicals. I want to suggest that periodicals of all types are oriented, like newspapers, to the contemporary. And they have a strong news profile, um, even in weighty quarterly reviews, which dominated the high cultural periodical press in, the, in um, Britain before 1859. These quarterly reviews consist of reviews, mainly of new or recent printed commodities, books, periodicals, or pamphlets many of which are advertised for sale by their publishers in ads elsewhere in the issue, in the wrapper. The importance of the element of contemporaneity in the contents of a book review may be seen in a piece from 1855 on the relatively obscure topic of translation, based on new works originally in German. It demonstrates the lengths to which a reviewer will go to spice a review on a specialized subject to enhance its contemporaneity. It begins, a clergyman of the Charles Honeyman species once told us that he never set about preparing his sermons until Saturday evening, for he trusted to providence. Honeyman, being a fictional priest, satirized in a novel by um, William Makepeace Thackeray, uh, the Newcombs, that had recently completed its serial publication two months earlier in August. The author of this um, anonymous book review is Marianne Evans, who is later uh, to become George Eliot. And she's writing in The Leader, a progressive weekly combining arts and politics. Not only are the newly published works, the, in this case translations, brought to the attention of the reader by the periodical that selected them for reviewing, but the author inserts a further topical reference to a current novel by a well-known author to embed the review further in the tissue of the present. Editorial material in a periodical is located in between more than one set of parameters, synchronically and diachronically, in between or among other print media, 
competing for buyers and readers at the moment of issue, for example, the leader and Thackeray's part issue novel, and in between the past future economy of serial publication. As a Mercury, periodical content is in between the new event, the publication of new books or the opening of a new play, and the reader. Of the arts, the commodification of new literature and drama was more visible and normalized in 19th century life than other forms. Books were for sale, drama was produced in theaters all over the country that sold tickets. Insofar as visual art circulated in the public sphere, it was through sales of cheap prints, but mainly through engravings, it illustrated papers and books. Neither of these forms of remediation tended to include much new fine art. Graphic art was the field of originality in the press. However, as with new writing and drama, so new visual art was appropriated in the upmarket periodicals news agenda. Art practice and exhibitions are regularly reviewed in periodicals by critics who might be journalists, they might be artists, and they might be literary authors. Reporting on the late, latest current art exhibition to which readers should be alerted and which the periodical recommends or not. Such news sits in periodicals among the other categories of non-political news that appeared only sporadically in the newspaper press. As we shall see, art, which might appear far from the hard political news that dominates the dailies, is similarly involved in newsworthy campaigns, corruptions, rebellions, feuds, criticism of outdated institutions, and policies that are covered and enacted in the pages of periodicals. They appear as news, the subject of leaders, in long-running correspondence, in reviews, in gossip, or news paragraph columns, and also in ads. So I want to look at one cultural cluster of non-political news in the periodical press in the 1890s, in which the Mercuries not only report events in the war observed by the new art criticism outside of its pages, for example, in the purchasing and the exhibition policies of the Royal Academy, these events, but they also conduct a war of opinion in their columns in the journals. Just as the political leaders of the newspaper press characteristically aimed at policy and law changes, so the periodicals in this instance of culture warfare um, were intending to shape contemporary events outside of its pages. Stead's government by journalism campaign in 86 enshrined a top-down model with the editor leading readers to informed and moral responses to contemporary politics through the messages of the journal. Positing the newspaper press as the only Bible the millions had at their disposal, Stead positioned editors as biblical prophets and their readers as ignorant believers requiring to be led to the promised land. Whereas in upmarket periodicals, the model was dialogic and much more collective involving a plurality of voices. There was pointed debate among critics around what was called the new art criticism in the periodical press. Between periodicals, between critics and institutions, and between critics and artists. The discussion raised questions about the politics, not of parliament, but of a cultural institution, and about what constituted, quote, the foundations of art criticism, as one critic, P.G. Hamilton, titled an article in 1893, and also issues about who is the best qualified to write meaningful art criticism, the artist or the literary critic, the professional or the amateur, at a time when artists, critics, and journalists were all seeking professional status. Stemming originally from the exhibition of Degas' painting, L'Absinthe, at the opening of the Grafton Gallery in London in February 1893, debate about the new art criticism and the issues it raised has extended from the 19th century to the present. The affair of the new art criticism occupied the periodical press initially between February and April 1893. And this is a a uh, kind of chronological um, uh, representation 
of some of the pieces I'm going to talk about and the way it unfolded. It's a very, it's quite a short window um, uh, as a provocation to issues that stretch way beyond it into the 20th century. Um, so we're talking about the periodical press between February and April 1893 here. Now, George Moore, um, a realist, uh, novelist, and a trained artist, was also employed as a weekly anonymous reviewer of art exhibitions in The Speaker, um, where he functioned as the mercury between exhibition and reader in the liberal, weaker, liberal weekly, The Speaker, sorry. Moore also exemplifies another set of parameters in which periodicals are located, that between the event and books, Moore selected articles from his journalism to publish a book of collected and remediated pieces, which appeared in 1893, about what he now magisterially calls modern painting. In, so this is a series of reviews on the art exhibitions uh, of the recent past. It's now called Modern Painting. In this echo of the title of John Ruskin's famous multi-volume Modern Painters, published a generation earlier, but still holding sway, Moore invoked a comparison with Ruskin and challenged Ruskin's dicta. Moore's book is in turn reviewed by an eminent critic, Walter Pater, in a daily newspaper supplement in 1893. So this is a literary supplement. He, however, Pater, does not live long enough to collect it into an anthology of critical pieces like his recent collection in 1889 called Appreciations. Moore then was not alone in using his periodical reviews stemming from an event, a new exhibition or a book, to constitute the matter of a new format for his work, a book, in turn to be reviewed by other critics who might, as Pater might have, collected their pieces in turn for their new book. In this sense, periodical material was successively between a series of events such as exhibitions on the reader, books composed of recent reviews, and the subsequent reviews of these books, which reviews repeated the cycle. In publishing his review that endorses Moore's point of view, Walter Pater enters the new art criticism debate about what constitutes art and how that definition is reflected in the exhibition policies, purchases, and membership of institutions such as the Royal Academy and the Tate Gallery who were the main arbiters of the field of art in Britain at this time. Alleging that their power is pernicious, Moore and D.S. McCall, who was a young artist and critic, argue that together the institutions work to form, to confirm traditional hierarchies of European and ancient classical art, and to act as a gatekeeper against contemporary art of the French Impressionist school and its adherents in Britain, such as Whistler. Led by McCall's initial intervention, a cluster of other new art critics and the periodicals in which they were based emerged as the main players of the campaign, in which Walter Pater's review of George Moore, who is one of them, figures. For our purposes, Pater's late intervention helps make visible another way in which the press functions in between as vehicles and consolidators of personal networks. While Pater and P.G. Hamilton were of the same generation, that is an older generation, Pater's primary affiliation with the young men, McCall and Moore, was personal and positive, unlike Hamilton's and not defined by the professional animus that Hamilton fills his review with. Pater's decision to review Moore's irascible book, it has to be said, Modern Painting in the Daily Chronicle, seems to have been an attempt to repair network relations between himself and George Moore, who was at that time a young Irish novelist who had spent time in Paris. Pater's gesture, his favorable review, was a surprise to Moore. Acquainted since 1885 and correspondence, uh, Pater and Moore, they fell out in August 87. When Pater refused to review Moore's naturalistic novel, A Mere Accident, in another newspaper, on the basis of its violence and its depiction of abnormal states of mind, this is what Pater writes to Moore, part of that refusal might have been because Pater was publishing anonymously in a church newspaper, <laughs> the, the Guardian. He doesn't say that to Moore. 
But I want to say that the practice of withholding or giving reviews is part of network functioning. This failure to consolidate a personal network through publication of a favorable review in the past is part of the same phenomenon as the appearance of the favorable review in 1893. Networks are animated and published, publicized in and by periodicals. This process, which was castigated as log rolling in the period in Britain, is one of the many ways in which the periodical press participates in the print economy. Pater's review of Moore is also tacitly supported by Call and the recent New Art Criticism debate, to which it was making a visible and signed contribution by a famous and respected critic. So by 1893, Pater had known McCall over a decade, having met and entertained him when McCall was an Oxford undergraduate in 1882 and co-editor of the Oxford magazine, to which Pater contributed uh, by McCall's invitation. And by 1893, McCall had already begun to make a reputation as a critic on The Spectator and as a painter having begun to exhibit regularly in the New English Art Club from 1892. Moreover, in the autumn of 1893, McCall reciprocated Pater's support. That is, he was thanking him. He bought together Pater and an artist, William Rothenstein, who was a young man of 21, in connection with Rothenstein's first book project, a fine art folio of lithographs, Oxford characters, in which Pater was to appear. Now, Pater died soon after he sat for Rothenstein's um, sketch, uh, lithograph, before the serial part, including him and his fellow character, was published. But McCall figured significantly in the last years of Pater's life, and I, this is part of that network of support that I'm referring to. Pater's intervention in the new art criticism debate months earlier, before Rothenstein appeared, demonstrates how such networks were kept alive through the press. In addition, to the function of the press in enabling networks. It functions in the establishment and consolidation of the reputation of its writers and that of its own brand, its title, which thrives on the affiliation of the contributor with the title in which it appears. So for example, the supplement of the Daily Chronicle, they regarded Pater as a prize in raising its profile and literary status. And as a public critic, mindful of his own, rep of his own reputation, Pater wanted to be seen to participate in the debate on the progressive side of this aesthetic issue, as well as supporting his friends. So Pater's publication of a signed review in a literary supplement of a daily newspaper also indicates the gradual movement in Britain of literary critics in the last quarter of the century to move with the times and to publish in more popular and cheaper formats than the upmarket monthlies in which literary and art criticism appeared. There's yet another manifestation of this debate in 93 that transfers the politics of the new art criticism to the field of literature and introduces a fourth man, Arthur Simmons, to the network of McCall, Moore, and Pater. Of them, he is the youngest. He's half of Walter Pater's age. And like the New Art Criticism campaign, Simmons' article, The Decadent Movement in Literature, appears in the periodical press, insisting on the contemporary as news and alerting readers to its news content by its manifesto tone. It is like the New Art Criticism discuss, it discusses British and French practitioners in tandem, and it argues for the merits of 19th century French literature um, without a health warning, which in Britain is uh, absolutely necessary at this time, how pernicious French literature might be, and so on. Pater is one of two English decadents who are included by Simmons in the decadence piece, along with the Goncourt, Verlain, and Wiesmann. But the periodical in which Simmons' article appeared is less insular, it is American, and of a different type than the news-oriented metropolitan weeklies and dailies that carried the new art criticism debate and the upmarket monthlies in which it was followed up. So paid, um, Simmons' article uh, appeared in Harper's New Monthly magazine, which was an illustrated monthly of entertainment of high quality and well-established. But it was nudged by McClure's a new, genuinely mass market rival. Bidding to keep its share of the market, Harper's included two sensational decadent pieces, 
that were linked as such in the advertising of the number. Among its miscellaneous mix of feature articles, fiction, poetry, and criticism. Sorry. Yes, okay, I, I have one page more, okay. Simmons' piece was peered, paired with Apollo and Piketty, a signed queer short story by Pater. So late in life, in the single month of November 93, uh, Pater, through his own story and that of Simmons, his young friend, appeared closely affiliated to decadence. It was, this was an association that Pater uh, had avoided over 20 years. Um, his intervention in June 93 in the New Art Criticism de Debate um, was um, a, a precursor to the coming out of decadence in Harper's four months later and of Pater himself as a decadent. Simmons went on to revise and reprint a version of the Long Harper article on decadence in the book, The Symbolist Moment, Movement in Literature. So, the article appears in a different form in a book in 1899 in which he strips out the British entirely. This pattern of Simmons of repurposing his output as a journalist by remediating them into books is repeated throughout his career to the degree that it is characteristic of his book production. Thimmon, Simmons, who thrived on the contemporary, um, always used periodicals in between. Individual and articles and reviews are shuffled and reshuffled to compose many book collections over decades, suggesting that he might have developed a large and well-indexed morgue of his periodical pieces in order to recombine them efficiently. So Simmons systematically relied on scissors and paste. His long, late obituary tribute to Pater that appeared in 1896 in the Savoy, the decadent periodical he founded and edited, drew on the earlier Harper's Pater, he immediately reprints it uh, in 1897 uh, in a book uh, called um, Studies in Two Literature, in a section of it called Contemporary Literature. Um, and in 1932, it reappears alone as a standalone book. In the interim, parts of it surfaced in other periodical articles by Simmons. So this volume of 1897 is dedicated to George Moore, and that cements the network of these four actants in the New Art Criticism Trail and the periodicals in which it took place. Pater reviewing Moore, tacitly endorsing McCall, Simmons on Pater, Moore praising McCall, and Simmons dedicating his book to Moore. Now, lastly, a decade later, McCall publishes a large format art book, 19th Century Art, published in 1902, and it's reviewed by Simmons in March 1903. And Simmons now appears professionally as part of McCall's network in his prominent favorable notice of the book in the Fortnightly Review, where McCall's achievement is enhanced and generalized through the heading of the review, the painting of the 19th century, the painting. The article exemplifies the mediating functions of periodical content. It's part in a communication trajectory from event exhibition to book to periodical book and ads and back to multiple book. Um, I'm going to um, telescope here. Um, just after um, McCall's book appeared and Simmons reviews it, uh, and this review is a puff. It's evident of the log rolling within a network. Um, and um, uh, McCall goes on to a second campaign in the press against the Royal Academy in The Spectator, his periodical base about the misappropriation of the Royal Academy of a bequest, the Chantry bequest, which is a fund for the acquisition for the nation of outstanding works. And McCall argues tenaciously between April 1903 and August 1904, over more than a year, the trustees had used the funding for the purchase of mediocre art because of their failure to understand the merit of contemporary uh, continental and British work. And McCall, of course, connects these articles and publishes them in a book in 1904. Simmons characteristically goes on to reprint his article on McCall's book at least five times in different collections over two decades. Um, and you know, most interestingly, in Studies in Seven Arts in 1906. Foucault has promised, prompted us to re-examine the nature of authorship by turning analysis to the way authorship functioned. In his wake, media historians have discussed how periodical editors functioned and conceptualized and reconceptualized the communication circuit in which the press always figures. 
What I've attempted here is to extend the rec recognition of periodicity as a divining structure of the press to include two other time-driven definitive elements, its contemporaneity and news as parts of the formal structures of time in journalism. With these in mind, I have focused on exploring the functions of the periodical in relation to its multiple contingencies, rather than in respect of any single relation to the editor, author, reader, publisher, or advertiser. I've selected a single instance in the 19th century art press to test this approach. Okay, thank you so much, Laurel, for I guess what I took from that was a reminder that no matter what kind of periodical we work on, whether a quite august kind of literary studies periodical or a daily newspaper, time is what we have to remember to always think about in its variety of forms. You saw me thinking about time quite a lot there. Um, but that's what we always have to come back to, and time and mediation, uh, and those kind of twin aspects of what makes the periodical distinctive. So talking of time, uh, you knew I'd get there in the end. Uh, we are a little bit behind, and we know we've, some of us have got to run across to another building, but it would be terrible for us not to find time for a couple of questions from the audience. So if you've got questions, comments, they're very, very welcome. Put your hand up now, and I will find you with the microphone so that we can ensure that they are translated from whichever language you decide to express them in. <laughs> So thank you very much. I just have one quick, hopefully quick, uh, question about illustrations. So uh, you are uh, you talked about art and art reviews and critics um, in different time. So um, were there also illustrations of the works and what kind of illustrations? Of course, in the end of the 18th centuries, no photos. But maybe when uh, new publications uh, of the same text were on different medias, were there other illustrations, different illustrations, or maybe there weren't illustrations yeah. there? Yes. Well, there were no illustrations in the periodicals that I was talking about um, in the weekly press. Uh, that is, the spectator, you know, the speaker, none of those had illustrations at that time. But there was an art press, um, and some of, them, some of the periodical titles were very sumptuous. Um, I'm thinking about the magazine of art, uh, for example. Um, but um, so those illustrations were either lithographs or um, um, steel engravings or earlier in the century, wood engraving. I mean, I think, um, I hope Brian Maidman will be here to talk about some of this uh, next. But, um, and there were, of course, all kinds of graphic cartoons and uh, so on. But whether general readers of the debate in The Spectator, uh, who had not been to the Grafton Gallery, had actually seen the Degas picture, um, I, can't, I can't tell you whether, and I haven't, I might look at this, I will look at it actually, to see at what point some of the art press, you know, picked up and included um, an engraving of the Degas image. Um, the other alternative is that there were free print, Im uh, not free, but um, standalone print images made of steel engravings that reproduced. Um, I don't suppose they were, they could have been hand colored. They could have been hand colored. But, I, you know, I don't, I, you know, the newspaper press was extremely um, shy of illustration, and the periodical press. Um, was much more um, receptive to illustration, but there was a distinction between, uh, on the whole, uh, titles that, in that did include illustrations very, maybe, um, um, intermittently, and 
a whole category called illustrated papers. I don't know if that, does that answer your question? Don't. Not in that tiny <laughs> window. Okay, just for those of you who couldn't hear the question, the follow-up question, so it's just clarifying that absolutely the, the contributions you were talking about, the pieces you were talking about, didn't have illustrations. Mm -hmm. So one more question, maybe. I was almost going to ask a question. <laughs> Inevitably, you're a long way from the microphone. <laughs> um, thank you, Laura. That was absolutely fascinating. I'm just wondering, um, in terms of those networks you were talking about, George Moore and Potter and McCall and others, um, um, and they were talking about a, a kind of a very certain ideal of art, and this was, you know, the, the kind of the high art of the, the Royal Academy, etc. And I'm just wondering, can like there was also a like, there's also a hierarchy here between newspapers and periodicals, oh, yeah. and I'm wondering when they were writing about this sort of high art in these, were they sort of reinforcing, um, I suppose, their position as as arbiters of the cultural of the artistic in these highbrow magazines? Just could you talk a little bit more about that, maybe about their their position? They were. Um, I mean, you know the. The combination of, you know, um, patronage and, you know, the two repositories of national art, you know, with, um, if you like, dealers, that was one of the arguments, you know, and collectors, meant that um, younger, I guess, dealers or more um, uh, risky uh, purchases were not voices that were heard within, you know, the Royal Academy, which um, I think was, you know, posited on the highest um, example, including the French Academy, <laughs> of include, you know, of inclusion. And so these younger upstarts were, you know, I mean, I think generation and age was a real factor here. Um, as well as, um, and, and as well as, you know, the, um, the gentrification, you know, the, the class, if you like, of artists who are being, you know, um, uh, circulated here, then they're, they're not dead, they're alive. <laughs> they're, you know, much murkier and, you know, and less gentlemanly than those that are coming to the RA and sitting in their august bodies and so on. So, um, it was um, the strategy of the younger artists to form new, uh, the New English Art Club, you know, different spaces to exhibit. Uh, but clearly this was a, you know, a, a question of the younger generation of artists. I mean, McCall was an artist, you know, Moore was an artist, uh, as well as critics trying to push, you know, the um, gates down um, in the high art um, bastions and also the high art press. Uh, and um, um, similarly, you know, the um, epithet of decadence was a, you know, a very strong negative term that was being thrown at esthetes and, and decadence like Pater and, and many others. Uh, and when Simmons, you know, took that up and published his article in a in a much more popular um, um, context, um, and if you like, you know, <laughs> paralleled the British decadence with the French ones. That was also a way of consolidating and making space for the contemporary. And that's, a, you know, the, the whole kind of off limits notion of the contemporary in, you know, in um, recognizing national attainment. It was very strong. The contemporary was the riffraff of newspapers. You know, it did not have the august test of tradition. So a reminder of the connection between time, mediation, and kind of status, which is really important. I'm just gonna say one quick thing to abuse presidential privileges. Maybe somebody can answer this to me in conversation through the course of the day. I've, you've, 
your talk reminded me of the curious case of the kind of non-existence of the feuilleton in the Anglophone world in, in Britain compared to kind of France and Germany. I've always wondered kind of why that is. Um, we haven't got time to discuss that now. Okay, I'll just say thank you one more time for, for to Laurel and ask you to show your appreciation.